good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, uh, Bondage Breaker Discipleship class at Rock Solid Church. Uh, I'm M.T. Clark. This is the M.T. for Christ 24-7 podcast in our class tonight. Um, we just got finished sit, uh, singing uh, Hillsong's, um, Hillsong United's uh, Scandal of Grace. And I was starting to share my testimony. Um, I forget what year uh, I heard that first, but I was on work assignment in New York City. Um, and I had actually, you know, I'd been in the faith a couple of years and I hadn't been baptized yet. I heard, of, I knew Hillsong's music and I went to their church um, uh, while I was down on work assignment and ended up getting, getting baptized. And I don't remember the year, but we can totally look it up because it was the year of the Boston bombings. Um, where there was that terrorist, uh, you know, they blew up the bombs, those pressure cooker bombs uh, at the uh, at the Boston Marathon, and I know I know I know that because I was in New York City during a terrorist attack, and in New York City when there's a terrorist attack, it turns into a police state, um, and that and it and it was that day that I got baptized. So I'm I'm getting I get out of work. I get, leave my hotel, I get on the subway, and there's announcements like, we will check your bags if, we, you know, if you're stopped and asked, you know, we, have, we will check your bags and like all this stuff. And there's police uh, personnel on the streets with machine guns and, and just cars everywhere. And it was really sort of like, you know, sort of, you know, because we're in New York City, there's a terrorist attack, maybe something's going to happen here. You know, so it was sort of an uncertain time, and I couldn't think, of, you know, I love, you know, the timing was just strange um, that I'd be getting baptized that day. Um, but it really was, you know, for me, it was like this real um, moment of truth. It was like, I'm leaving this world of darkness behind, you know, where, where these things can happen. And I'm, 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 I'm committing myself even more to, to follow Christ um, by being baptized. And I remember it was an awesome. Uh, it was near. It was near Times Square, um, some hotel that has a pool. We could figure that out too, uh, you know, basically. Um, but when I was, and there was a bunch of people, and they had music, and and I got baptized, and I just felt like you know, I really felt like there was, there was, there was you know, an anointing or or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, another step. Uh, closer to Christ uh, in my commitment anyway you know he was always there when, as the minute I you know I uh, made him my Lord and Savior but uh, but when I got baptized I really felt spiritually you know like oh. el- electrified like alive and I remember walking out of the hotel and all the lights um, uh, of Times Square and, and, and police cars lined up uh, you know <laughs> like as far as the eye could see, and just like, just knowing that things would be different uh, from this point forward, and it's and it has been, and it's been like I mean, the greatest thing about our faith is we get milestones like that where we just go deeper and deeper um, from the moment we say yes, and we can just keep, you know, keep going closer to Him, and uh, solidify the beginning of your journey. Yeah, for real, where it was like no more games. Because when you, and then you, you know, like, hey guys, I got baptized. And it's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> whoa, I don't know about this guy. And that was before I got, you know, I got baptized, but that was before I went and recovered. Um, so, but, you know, you can't tell me one didn't have anything to do with the other. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? The, the, the Lord saves you and he draws you closer. And, and as you... You know, draw closer to him. He wants to. He wants to change you. He wants to make you more like you. You know, oh to, oh, to be like you, as the song said. You know, he and, sent you a message, and that's it. And and that's what he's doing in your life, Jeff. And you know, and you too, John. Um, you know, you guys just. You know, you can't tell me uh, you guys showed up here by mistake. <laughs> you know, you can tell me that, but you know, the Lord, the Lord has His hand on you, and He's He's dragging you along. Um, to, to keep following. Um, so, so a little bit of testimony there today. Um, uh, but 
and, and, and this sort of, you know, it was sort of a spontaneous testimony, I must say, but um, it has a lot to do with what, what we're going to teach tonight in terms of uh, spiritual warfare, in terms of we are, you know, focusing on our foundation um, in Christ. Because uh, uh, we need, in order to have a, a, a fortress against the enemy, we have to have a solid foundation of faith. And uh, that turns out to be one of our greatest weapons. Um, and the spiritual warfare, uh, <laughs> you know, imagery, that's the shield of faith, right? Um, it will protect you. Um, anyway, um, let's see. Is there any other announcements? Oh, yeah. Um, my blog is getting attention. Uh, we're doing a spiritual warfare class, right? We're talking about the enemy, right? Well, um, last week, Cheryl gave me a testimony of uh, what was happening in her life. And I used that and I put it in a blog. Um, basically about about her journey and just you know basically you know uh, the power of, of, of a Christian presence and uh, what she can do in other people's lives and how she can touch people and um, I shared that and on one of the social media sites um, because it had a little bit to do with the occult because the person she helped was somewhat you know spiritually um, sort of on the witch side um, so because of that that small mention uh, uh, in the in the post um, uh, and, and, the, and because of the way I titled it um, it got attention and basically I, I got a, a, a notification today that that um, someone someone replied to it and I was like oh the, hey somebody replied to it great well it turned out to be a Satanist wow. um, <laughs> and so and so like they said Satan is truth or whatever and they had these different websites or whatever that they wanted people to go to. But they were responding to my post, but basically, you know, the enemy is coming in literally and, and you know, making his presence known. And, and so, and what I did is I, I shared it on social media. I figured I'd put it out there just to show people that the kingdom of darkness is real. There are people who are actually committed to it and who are trying to share um, their views of the world um, and literally said Satan is God. Um, uh, and I just shudder to think, um, you know, of, of, uh, of the spiritual condition of people that are in that state. And, and of course, they're trying to strengthen his, uh, his uh, grasp on humanity. I that's right. No, yeah, right. Right. You know, so, see it every day. Right. And it's and it's darker it's darker and darker out there every day. And sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's not subtle at all, like to, to today's uh, post. But I, I took a shot of it, I shared it on Facebook, and I um, I deleted it or you know, I, I blocked the person, deleted it, and I'll be deleting the Facebook post later. Um, just to because I you know, hey, this is out there. And I think I'll just, you know, I don't want it in my history. Someone pulls it up and go, oh, uh, Satan is God. Let's check that out. Yeah. Satanisgod.org or whatever it was. Um, you know, no, I don't, I don't want to share that. Right. But I did want to share the fact that these things happen. Even the violence has taken place in this community over the past 48 hours. Really? Mm. Yeah, I... I the past 48 hours? There were several shootings in Hudson. Unfortunately, when the, when the temperatures go up, the yeah, tempers go up, yeah. and the enemy has a field deck, yeah. you know, because like I said, you know, I've, we've talked about this in this class, you know, he can put thoughts in our heads, you know, basically shoot a thought in them, kill them now, you know, that's a thought, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, are you going to let him get away with that? Yeah. Right. You know, aren't you a man? Stuff like that. It happens in the church. I want to kill them. You know, those are the things That's that, scary. you know, and I've had, yeah. you know, I, I, I think totally, I should. Totally against what we believe in as Christians. Right. You know, right. forgiveness. Well, what, what the big, well, and I've taught this before, is the big Satanist credo is revenge. So anything, you know, that's like their number one thing. That's like the thing they're so proud of is that they're into revenge. Yeah. So what are these retaliatory shootings probably? Uh, you're in, hitting in my business. You're after my whatever. I'm gonna kill you and get revenge, and then it, and then it doesn't end. Um, so we, you know, we pray that uh, as the temperatures decrease this weekend, hopefully, uh, you know, there will be some peace 
amidst the, the loss. But that's, yeah, Hudson, Hudson in the summer. Yeah. And it uh, happens a lot. And we've had people in this room directly affected by the violence. Um, really? Oh, yeah. yeah, through the years. Yeah, our ministry, our recovery ministry, we've had people come to this place who that. lost people, who, yeah. who, who lost people, who had people put in jail, um, both sides. Uh, of it, so we're in the city. It's a small, somewhat peaceful city for most of the time, until it's not. And uh, you know, it's just a reflection of that people need God. Um, and so we're going to touch on that foundation. But that's 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 the reality we live in. Um, so that's enough introductory. Um, Anderson starts off chapter three t- um, of, of the book, introducing a testimony of this woman named Lydia. Um, somebody, a middle-aged woman who he met, um, who came to him, and she was full of memories of ritual and sexual abuse, which haunted her continually throughout her uh, Christian life. When she came to see him, her damaged self-image seemed beyond repair. Uh, she told her, as she told her story, she didn't display any emotions really, but her her words reflected total despair. Um, Lydia perceived herself to be evil. Um, she, she was no good for anybody because, well, you know, it's one thing to think you're evil, and that, but in Lydia's case, people actually told her she was evil and that she was nothing but trouble, you know? So, I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but when I was, like, outside of the faith and because of the things I did, I thought I was evil. Um, that's just part of my testimony. I always thought, you know, my sarcastic ways or whatever... You know, is is was you know evil, not not really dark, dark evil, but you know, not good for sure. Um, you know, you think of yourself that way because you're not living right. So what can you be? It's a logical conclusion. You're sort of on the side of darkness. You're evil. Um, but Anderson, uh, being a Christian counselor, he assured her that uh, that because she was a child of God, she was a Christian. She was not evil. Uh, he read several of the statements from his Who I Am in Christ list uh, that we hand out in those bookmarks and everything. Um, and just to read, you know, just a reminder um, of who she was, you know, and what her scriptural identity is. Um, and then he asked her to read it out loud. Um, so he gave her the sheet of paper. He said, you know, start reading it. Well, she took it and she started to read it and she started stuttering. And she couldn't get the words out. And then suddenly her whole demeanor changed. And she turned to Anderson and sneered, no way, you dirty blank. And, like, and it was the enemy manifesting right there in the session. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, you know, aggressive responses, sudden turns of emotions, profanity, or violence are ways the enemy reveals himself in victims of oppression like Lydia. Um, but Anderson took authority over the enemy uh, through prayer in Christ's name, and, and led Lydia through the steps to freedom. Um, she was able to gain a new perspective of who she really is in Christ, realizing that she is primarily the product of the work uh, of Christ on the cross instead of the victim of her past. She was able to throw off the chains of spiritual bondage and begin living according to her true identity as a child of God. Uh, later, she, later um, you know, after that was done... Uh, she asked Anderson, she said, what is the deal with that paper you gave me? Because when I looked at it, you know, the, the words just seemed to disappear and the paper just seemed to go blank. And he said, was there something special about it? And he said, no, it was just normal pen and paper, you know, normal ink on paper. Um, and, you know, that, is, that, that type of thing happens in Anderson's ministry a lot. He's had guys contact him to get counseling. He sent him like teachings of his, uh, you know, tapes of his teachings. And he said, listen to the tapes and then come see me. Well, the guy, you know, the guy would come into the, the session and go, hey, the tapes you gave me are all blank. You know, they're no wow. good. And they'd play them in the office and they weren't blank. It was the enemy blocking, blocking the knowledge of their, you know, that would set them free. Um, so in, in, in Lydia's case, the, the paper seemed to go in blank, but it sh- maybe shouldn't surprise us too much because the enemy literally manifested uh, right after, you know, when she tried to read it. So things might have went blank just before, you know, the enemy made his presence known. Um, 
But there was something very significant about Lydia's realizing who she was in Christ. Uh, Satan had deceived her into believing she was, was worthless and evil, um, which was a lie. Um, he was dead set against her reading those statements of truth about her identity as a child of God. Uh, he knew that God's truth would disarm his, his lies just as surely as the light disarms the darkness. Um, and he wasn't about to give up without a fight. And like I said, that other guy, he, you know, he, he, he wasn't even able to listen to the audio tapes. Um, you know, why would Satan do that? Because nothing is more foundational to our freedom from Satan's bondage than understanding and affirming what God has done for us Amen. in Christ and who we are as a result. We, we all live according to our per- perceived identity, you know. Um, in fact, no one can consistently behave in a way that is di- inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. That was the key for me, Mark, learning who I was in Christ. That's because it. Up until that point, until my mid-40s, uh-huh. I-, I wasn't, I-, I just didn't know. Right. You know, I right. That. Well, and that's just it, James. You know, your your perceived identity was other. It wasn't who I am in Christ. It was something else. It was this guy's son, or the guy who always messes up, or you know, the guy with the long history of, of problems, or or whatever it was. Um, you know, that's that's it. And we can act a certain way, but if we really believe differently, it'll it'll show. You know, our attitudes, our actions, our responses, and our reactions to life circumstances are determined by our conscious and subconscious self-perception. If we see ourselves as helpless victims of Satan and his schemes, we'll live like that. um, And we'll be in bondage to his lies. But if we see ourselves as the dearly loved and accepted children of God that we really are, we'll live like children of God. Um... You know, tonight we're going to highlight several critical aspects of our identity in Christ. Uh, now, you guys have been through the victory over the darkness. This might be old school. But as I was saying to James before, James, could you read um, Psalm 1 1 real quick? 1 1 11? Uh, nope, number 1. Oh, 1 1. And just number 1. Yeah, and one of my it's a short ones. psalm, but it sort of makes it. a point. I'm reading out of the Amplified uh, version, guys. Uh, Blessed. Fortunate, prospered, and favored by God is the man or woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or the ungodly, uh-huh. following their advice and example. It goes a little further. Yep. So, or stand in the path of sinners, I guess hanging out with them, uh-huh. or sit down to rest in the seat of the scoffers or those who ridicule the word of God. Uh-huh. Don't we know the second yep. verse? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, or the word of God, and on his law and his precepts and teachings, he habitually makes a habit of, I guess, meditates day and night. Day and night, that's it. I mean, it's just, what does he get to day and night? But you gotta love the Amplified, because if there's any question of what they're talking about, the Amplified hits it from every side. Let me read the reward side of it. verse 3 real quick. Okay. That's the reward for, And he will be like a, a tree, firmly planted, firmly planted. fed, by streams of water, I think the Holy Spirit, which yields its fruit in its season. Yep. Its leaves does not wither, and whatever he or she does, he prospers and comes to maturity. There you go. And, wow. and that's it. And then, and, you know, if, if, you, if you're wondering what psalm you should read, you start at number one. Um, because that's great, great advice. That's great promises of God there, you know. Don't follow sinners. Uh, meditate on his word day and night. And that's why, you know, reviewing stuff isn't a bad idea. We're, we're told to do it day and night, so maybe we'll, we'll revisit some things yeah, from time to time. A godly counsel can come from my own head sometimes. Right, my own thoughts, not maybe just necessarily towards right. right. And and as we go through, and as we go through our lives of faith, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see a verse a million times, and then you read it again, and suddenly you get a, a new revelation of what it means, or you know, or this point in time, it's different. Um, that's the Holy Spirit revealing things to you. So it's not a bad idea. Plus, this world changes. We change. We get older. We forget stuff. And what we can't forget is who we are in Christ. So that's why we're, you know, the foundation of our faith is, is on what we will stand on. 
Um, so yeah, um, they recommend, uh, as we do the bondage break, they recommend that you, that you study Victory Over the Darkness in conjunction with it. Now anybody listening online, uh, we have all of the Victory of the Darkness lessons, 1 through 13, available on the podcast. So if you want to check that out, you can. If you want to contact me and get the class materials for it, you can email me. Um, so it's available. But guess what? It's not required, um, you know, or anything. Like I said, you know, I, I like to mention once, one, one, once per class that this is, you know, for your benefit. It's, uh, we're not grading you. Um, and the lessons more or less stand on their own, so you can jump in at any minute. There's a podcast, so if you miss anything, you know, this is just to build you up in Christ. And, um, you know, this is, you know, quote unquote, I would say it's a college level course, but I'm not charging tuition and I'm not asking for anything. Um, you know, basically because, uh, I just think the, the, the material is valuable um, for our Christian living because that's the thing that's we know how to worship. We do that Sunday thing really good. But what do we do from you know Sunday afternoon to, <laughs> to Sunday morning? Um, we got to live it um, if we want to have that freedom in Christ and, and experience it. And the more we walk in it, the more the more we do it. Um, so we gonna, we're going to go right back to the foundation. And I sort of touched on some of this last week. Um, our physical makeup. Our, we are comprised of at least two major parts. Our, our material self, which is our physical bodies, and our immaterial self, which is our soul slash spirit uh, with the ability to think, to feel, to choose, and to relate to God. Now there's a dichotomous view, which means two, um, where it's just body and soul, where people say oh, it's just body, body or soul or body slash spirit, you know, whatever. But we, we agree with the, what the Bible teaches, which is a trichotomous view where it's body, soul, and spirit. And so the big question <laughs> on everybody's mind usually is like, what in the world is the difference between my soul and my spirit? And we hope to answer that tonight. Um, the soul um, is, is best known in psychology. It would be known as the personality. Um, that's our mind, our will, and our emotions. Basically, you know, who, what makes you, you? It's sort of your personal personality. You know, he always acts like that. That's, that's Jeff. You know, that's John. He's, he's like that kind of guy. He's a friendly guy, whatever. Um, that's our soul. Um, our spirit is, is, well, it's dormant or dead in, the unsaved, in an unsaved person. Um, it's just sort of a dormant or dead thing. Uh, that's that's inside us, um, and what the Spirit does it enables us to contact and to receive God Himself. Mm-hmm. So when we come to faith in Christ, they say the Holy Spirit comes comes within you, and you become spiritually alive. It's like you get spiritually activated. You become you have eternal life. Um, John three six shows us uh, our spirit has the ability to receive God. Um, that verse says, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, so there you go. You know, uh, maybe I didn't have a spirit before or whatever. It wasn't working. Um, but yeah, when, we, when we're born again, our, we, we start to receive um, from the Lord. Our, our spirit becomes alive and suddenly we want to we wanna follow the Lord. We want to read his word. We want to we wanna live like a Christian. Um, because we, we've been given new life and it's not for when we die, you know, when we die someday, it's, it's happening right then and now, you know, every day. Um, for those at home, if you want to check out verses on this, uh, I would, I would request it, you know, go to John, the book of John chapter three, uh, Jesus Christ talks to Nicodemus about, Hey, spiritual mysteries and stuff. Um, you must be born again, John 3, 3. And then there's 5, 8, and 15 through 20. Um, that's got all the big ones. Uh, you want to you go there. It's got John 3, 16. That's, you know, the, the reason, you know, why God so loved the world. That's it. God so loved the world. He, he sent his only begotten son. That no one was, John 3. That's it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the one. So if people say, what's born again? Well, ask Jesus, because he's the one who made it up um, to try to tell us that this is a spiritual reality that happens um, when we come to faith in him. Um, when we're born again, we're born of the spirit in our human spirit, not in our soul. Now, the way I, you know, this is sort of crazy. I, I usually get the whiteboard out for this, but, you know, 
there's spirit beings like angels and demons. And now they can inhabit bodies or whatever, but usually they're sort of immaterial. And then there's animals, right? You know, there's, there's my dog who's, who's such a lovely dog. He's great. He seems that I would say he's got a soul. Okay. <laughs> you know, come on, look at his eyes. Uh, that dog's got a soul, but to be made in the image of God, man sort of is different. We have soul and spirit, and that's what makes man different from the animals, okay? Um, also, in terms of function, you know, our, our, our soul, let's see, I don't want to get ahead. When we are born again, we are born of the spirit in our human spirit, not in our soul. We receive the Lord, and he came to live in our spirit. So, like they say, he's in you, that's, that's the deal. So what about our soul? Our soul is who we are, our personality, and is composed of our mind, our, our emotion, and our will. God created us with these faculties so we can express him. So in terms of function, our soul is to express him. How do you express God? Well, we did it before we started in worship. When we were singing that song, we were magnifying the Lord in song. And I don't know about you, but you know, I think my spirit is there too. Um, but you, we use our soul to express ourselves and how to speak. You know, That's part of your personality. That's your soul. So your soul expresses God. Yeah. God's person, purpose in creating human beings with a spirit and a soul was that they would receive him in their spirit and express him through their soul. So we've, we receive him in our spirit. We express him in our soul. And that's the difference in function. Um, where do you get all this from, Mark? Well, if you don't trust me, maybe you'll trust the Virgin Mary. Uh, and Luke 1, 4, 6, and 4, uh, 4, 6, it's 46 and 47. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. So right there, that in the Bible sort of shows you the soul magnifies or expresses the Lord and the spirit receives the Lord. So there you go. Um, the function of our spirit is to contact God and receive God. Um, so when we pray, we're doing it in our soul, our spirit. It's sort of like all that. And that's why, you know, people say, you know, if you don't know how to pray, just pray in the spirit, meaning, you know, sometimes groanings or whatever. God knows what you mean um, because he can... He knows your heart, he knows your soul, he knows your spirit, Amen. and you're going to be in contact with him via that spirit. And he's going to know exactly what you need and what he's going to do. Um, and the function of your soul, of course, is to express God. And, and if you didn't, if you like that, basically I got that on blog.biblesforamerica.org. And I asked, basically asked, asking the question, uh, the difference between soul and spirit. So if you want to Google it, do that, that's how I found it. Um, our body is in union. Now our body, can't forget that, our body is in union with our soul and spirit. You know, that makes us physically alive. Because guess what? If we're not in union with our body, we're in the spirit realm. Um, you know, to be absent with the body is present with the Lord. Um, as, as a Christian, because you're a Christian, our spirit is in union with God because of our conversion. And that makes us spiritually alive. Um, when, when God created Adam, he was totally alive. He, had, he was physically alive and spiritually alive. But because of Adam's sin and subsequent spiritual death, every person who comes into the world is born physically alive but spiritually dead. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, God said, when you eat of it, you will die. And guess what? He ate of it and he was still walking around. So what's the deal? Well, he died spiritually and he did die later physically. Um, it wasn't like, wait for it. No, well, he was separated spiritually from God. Um, that was the spiritual death that happened as soon as he, as soon as he, uh, uh, as soon as he, as soon as he sent. You know, being separated from God, you lack the presence. You know, so all of us, uh, we were separated from God, and we lack His presence and wisdom in in our lives. And so you, we learn to live independently of God. We center on our own interest. Um, this independence from God is referred to in Scripture as the flesh. You ever hear that? He lives in the flesh. Well, that's just me, Bill. You know, that's that's me doing my thing every day. Um, when you're born again, though, um, your spirit was united with God, and you became spiritually alive. Uh, and Scripture repeatedly declares, "You are now in Christ, and Christ is in you." 
And it's like this paradox. He's in us and we're in him. Uh, But both are true. Since Christ who is in you is eternal, right? God's eternal. Um, That spiritual life you have received from him, that's eternal too. So you you don't have to wait until you die to get eternal life. Uh, You possess it right now. Um, And now if you've not come to Christ, um, I suggest you just... Open your heart, open your mouth, and pray to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, and you can experience spiritual life. Um, he wants you to. He's, if you're listening to this anywhere, he's calling you, or he's already called you. Um, let's see. And contrary to what Satan would like you to believe, he can't ever take eternal life fr- away from you because he can't take Jesus away from you, who promised never to leave you or forsake you. So... You make that profession of faith, you can act a fool, live a bad life, but if you really did it and God recognizes it, you're saved. But the thing is, if you act a fool, you're going to doubt it and everyone else is going to doubt it and you won't know until, until you go into eternity. And that's no way to live. Um, you know, you can live a defeated life if, if you accept him, but don't follow him. And Ask me how I know, uh, you know, because I did. Um, have you ever heard, and, and how do those people live? You know, how do those people live? Well, they usually say things like this. Have you ever heard a Christian refer to himself as a, just a sinner saved by grace? Um, yes. Have you ever referred to yourself that way? I know I have. Um, you know, if you see yourself as a sinner, um, what, 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 what would you expect a sinner to do? Sin. You'll sin. Right. Uh, your Christian life will be mediocre at best with, uh, with little to distinguish you from your, a non-Christian, um, filling you with feelings of defeat. Um, all you'll do is feel guilty. Um, Satan will seize the opportunity to pour on the guilt and convince you there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, by the way, but he's going to pour on the condemnation. He's going to pour out the guilt and convince you that you are doomed to an up and down spiritual experience and make you wonder if you're even a Christian. As a defeated Christian, you'll confess your sin and strive to do better because you'll know because you're convicted by the Holy Spirit. This isn't how you're supposed to live your life. And you'll be like, I know God, I'm sorry. Uh, You know, and you know, that just, that cycle just continues again and again and again. Again, ask me how I know. (laughs) <laughs> been there, done that yeah. for years. Yeah, um, and you did it before, you know, the funny thing is, when, before you come to Christ, you didn't feel so guilty. It was just like business as usual. We're going to go back to doing that again. Right. Fun times. Yeah. Oh, I got a headache, but, you know, whatever. Right. Exactly. Um, we'll get past it. We'll start again early, so we'll get past it that much sooner. You know, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. So as a defeated Christian, you'll confess your sin and strive to do better, but inwardly you'll just admit, I'm broken, I'm a mess, I'm a drunk, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, uh, this, is a this is how I am, I can't change. A liar. Um, you know, I'm incapable of change and victory, you know, and victory over your besetting sin. It's just my pet sin and I'm going to keep it for the rest of my life. I, it's just who I am. You know, um, the things that occupy your time, you know, those besetting sins. If it's if it's those if it's something other than God that you're spending all your time doing, that's what you're worshiping. And not that it, you know things are necessarily bad, but it, it depends on how they end up. But are we just really just a, a sinner saved by grace? No way. Uh, the Bible doesn't refer to believers as sinners. Not even sinners saved by grace. Um, believers are called saints, holy yeah. ones, yeah. Uh, who occasionally sin. You know, we're not going to, again, a paradox. Um, We become saints at the moment of salvation and can live as saints in our daily experience if we, if, if we believe what God has done and continue to affirm who we really are in Christ. Because otherwise, oh, I feel like, I feel like a sinner. I'm sinning. But no, if we stand in our identity, We'll be like, well, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm a child of God. And I'm not supposed to, you know, no thanks. You know. Plus, hopefully, you know, all the bad consequences of doing it for most of your life should, you know, ring true too. Never stopped this before, but now we can use that knowledge to, to change. Um, if you fail to see yourself as a child of God, you'll struggle to live like one. And Satan will have little trouble convincing you that you are no different from who you used to be uh, before Christ. And, you, and, of course, 
when, 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 you know, they'll just also say that you're, you know, worthless or, you know, you're not of value to God or anyone else. But by appropriating, you know, appropriating by faith the radical transformation of your core identity from sinner to saint, you will have a powerful, positive effect on your daily resistance to sin and, and Satan. Like I said, if you believe you're a Christian, I'm going to live, you know, and if you're, if you believe it and you receive it, you'll want to live it. And, you know, that's, that's how it's easier to say to sin is say no to sin when your identity is, is, is rooted in righteousness. You know, that's not who I am anymore. It's, it's, you know, a good thing. And I always like to say, that's not who I am anymore. I know the bad things it does. And I don't want anything to get between me and God. And, and yeah, yeah. you know, that's the three, the threefold, you know, answer to temptation. Um, declare who you are in Christ. Um, state the negative consequences and state the, your, your desire to uh, stay in relationship with the Lord, uh, stay in harmony with him. You know, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 tells us you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and were by nature children of wrath. You know, this describes our nature before we became, you know, became to Christ. Um, before we became Christians, our very nature was sin. Uh, and, and the result of our sin was death. Um, as much as, as such, we served ourselves and Satan as a matter of course. You know, like it was just sort of the way of the world. That's just what we did. It's what we learned to do. And uh, we just kept going. You know, it was just life. Um, 2 Peter 1 4 tells us um, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is the world by lust. At salvation, God changed our very essence. Uh, you are no longer in the flesh, you are in Christ. You, you had a sinful nature before your conversion, but now you are a partaker of Christ's divine nature. You're neither eternal nor divine, you know, um, but you are eternally united. With Christ's divinity. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5 8 uh, tells us you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Uh, in the face of Satan's accusations that we are no different, we must believe. And live in harmony with the fact that we are eternally different in Christ. You know, something changed here. Um, and when we stand on that, that's when we get the victory. The, the New Testament refers to the person you were before, before you, were, you received Christ as your old self. At salvation, your old self, which was motivated to live independent of God, and uh, was motivated to live independent of God and was defined by sin. Um, that, that, that old self died. And your new self, motivated by your new identity in Christ and characterized by your dependence on God, came to life. I know that uh, Galatians 2.20 says, It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You know? um, your old self had to die to sever your relationship with sin, which dominated it. Being a new person doesn't mean that you were sinless. Um, but since you, your old self has been crucified and buried with Christ, you no longer need to sin. Um, your sin, you sin when you choose to act independently of God. It's still a choice. You know, your death to sin ended your relationship with sin as master, uh, but it did not terminate sin's existence. Sin is still alive, strong and appealing, but its power and authority have been broken. Um, your flesh, that part of you that was, you know, was trained to live independently of God before you met Christ did not die either. Um, you still have memories, habits, uh, conditioned responses, and thought patterns ingrained in your brain, which prompt you to focus on your, your own interest. Yeah, unfortunately, when I came to Christ, I was a big, you know, drinker. Um, <laughs> that was a habit. And guess what? Uh, it didn't break the habit, you know. Uh, luckily, God led me along the way after a few years um, to, to trust him enough. Uh, to, to give it up for good and it's worked um, and that's that's the thing we we break these strongholds these conditioned responses by by believing first believing that God will do it and believing that he's already done it um, 
and, and as we go, we, we prove it. We can live it. Uh, but you have to believe it, you know. Like I said, you can, you can sort of change your, your behavior somewhat through, through uh, your flesh. But if you don't change it in your spirit, it's going to go right back to the way it was. Um, it's, your, it's your responsibility to crucify the flesh on a daily basis. And that's it. We have to have faith enough for one day. Um, by learning to walk according to the spirit and by renewing our mind. We have to change the way we think about it. Because I've heard, you know, I've heard successful people in recovery go, you know, yeah, I don't drink anymore. Oh, man, I, I, I love it. Like, well, <laughs> well, why don't you just hate it? Um, you know, if we're going to think about the, the things we love so much that we don't do anymore, we're probably going to dr- be drawn back into them, you know, so... What we do is we shine the light of truth on what, how we used to live and how broken and disgusting and dirty and, and desperate and painful uh, those times were. Um, and, you know, there were some good times, but usually they're surrounded by a mess, you know, before, during, and after. Um, when, we, when we look at that honestly, then we, then, you know, then we see it for what it really was. Um, now, in the Bible, we, when we find a, a, a promise in the Bible, we claim it, you know. Um, he'll never leave us or forsake us. Claim that one, you know. That means he's with you all the time. You know, claim, claim eternal life. That way you, don't, you have no fear of death, you know. You'll just, your relationship with death changes. Now, you're not going to run out into the streets saying, <laughs> kill me now. Um, but, you know, it, it, you know, the peace that you have when you realize that your life will not end and that you are protected and cared for by the God who made all of existence, um, it should give you a comfort, you know? And we don't have to be afraid. Um, the Lord is with us. Nothing to be afraid of. You know? There's yeah. nothing to be afraid of because we have the highest authority on our side. Yeah. He's called us out of eternity to be with him forever. And it begins the moment you say yes, and it continues forevermore, um, which will be a trip. I can't imagine <laughs> what it's going to be like, but, um, but it's all true. Um, you know, when we come to a commandment in the Bible, we obey it. Um, but when we read a truth, we believe it. Uh, the verses in Romans 6, 1 through 11. So why don't you guys turn there, um, just so you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, I would have you read it, James, but you got like the amplified version, and we might be here all night. Version. What's that? I thought it was the best version. It's it's okay. I can read it. <laughs> it's a little wordy. Yeah, um, wordy. But but John or Jeff um, or 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 Cheryl, you, if you got it, if you yeah. can read it out loud as loud as you can. Okay. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And you know, you know, Romans 6, 1 through 11 teaches that Christ already died to sin. Okay? And because you are in him, you've died to sin too. Okay? You cannot die to sin because you're already dead. You can only believe it. Okay? Um, Christ, Christians who are still trying to die to sin are miserable and fruitless as a result because they are struggling to do something they have, that has already been done. Christ dying to sin is an acceptance of the death that what right. sin is. Right, right, right. exactly. And, and, and so, 
it's notice the use of the past tense in Romans 6, 1 through 11. Verse 2, it says, we who died to sin. That's us. We're dead to it. Um, Verse 3 says, all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. That means when we come to him, we, 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 you know, the the sign of baptism, which I talked about, you know, basically when, when you're baptized, they put you under the water and it's a symbol of you dying with Christ. And when you, when you were raised out of the water, it's a symbol of you being raised to life with him and your sin, it goes down to death and then to death and you're born anew. And, you know, that's just a symbol of baptism. Um, and in and, and verse 4, it says, we have been buried with him. So there you go. Um, uh, our uh, Verse 5 says, our old self was crucified with him, and our bo- body of sin might b- be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's verse 6, sorry. Um, verse 7 says, for, we, for he who has died is freed from sin. So we died when we... When we came to Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we're, we're alive, you know, we died to sin. Um, uh, verse 8 uh, says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we, should, we shall also live with him. So there's the spiritual life, you know, when we come to him in, in faith, you know. So as soon as you say, you don't have to touch the water to have this happen. Um, it happens as soon as you say yes to Jesus, Lord and Savior. That spiritual life the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And they say, the Spirit of Christ is in you. And that's, that's the spiritual conversion. This is a spiritual reality. Um, you are different. You are changed. Even though, like I said, a lot of things hasn't changed. Um, but we accept it. Why? How? By faith. <laughs> you know, we have to believe it. Um, since these versions are, uh, verses are past tense, indicating what is already true about us, we can only believe them. We can't do it you know we can only believe it and that's how we you know accept it by faith through our belief verse 11 summarizes what we have we we are to believe about our relationship to sin because of our position in christ Um, even so consider yourself to to be dead to sin but alive to god in christ jesus um you know uh that that verse consider yourself dead to sin um i remember a teaching from uh from somebody um, who's teaching about changing. God changed me, or, you know, Lord changed me. And they used Romans six eleven. And what they said is, like, whenever you're tempted, you go, you, you say to your sin, you go, I'm dead to that. And which I think is great, because you are dead to that. You're dead to that sin. So if you're tempted by it, you're like, no, no, I'm dead to that. So that's good. But I think the big part that we want to jump on it's not declaring yourself dead to everything as much as declaring yourself alive to Christ Jesus. You know, I think that's the key because otherwise you're doing that all day, resisting sin. That's just another, that's just another worldly way of trying to stop something that we, we always did. The spiritual way is to accept our life in Christ because otherwise it's just like, I'm not doing that no more. I ain't doing that more and more. I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. Well, guess what? It never worked before. Yeah. You know? I don't want to do that anymore, you know? Same, same verbiage, but the coming alive to Christ is it. This is who I am now. That's a different story. That's the game changer, I think. Um, that's not in the lesson, <laughs> um, but, but I think it's an important thing. And like I said, that's the, that's the thing I struggle with in my, in my faith walk is, you know, doing things by my own power at first and then learning later that, wow, if we just believe it, something changes. And, but you've got to believe it. And you have to remind yourself, yes, I, we do believe this. Yes, Lord, I do trust you. That's your trust. You know, um, that's your relationship with the Lord. The spirit, you know that trust spirit is, lives the spirit in you. Spirit goes out the window also. That's it. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the key. You've got to believe it to receive it. You know, these basic things, you know, are simple but profound because they are true. And they are, or, and the thing is, it's like, how do I get there? No, no, you're already there. You know, how do we get there? You just have to believe it and keep on believing. Keep on believing, I think is a song. (laughs) But (laughs) whatever. Um, It doesn't matter whether you feel dead to sin. No, that's it. You're dead to that. I don't feel it like I don't feel it. Well, that's where the faith comes in. We're going to have to, and it's volitional too. We're going to have to choose again and again and again. And guess what? The The more we choose it, that becomes a pattern. That becomes a habit. 
now we are faithful people of God because we've been doing it so long that the enemy can't get in there anymore. Um, Because we just, you know, we we put up our defenses. You know, Mr. Miyagi taught us to wax on, wax off, and suddenly we're blocking all the enemy's stuff. We didn't even know we had it. It was in us the whole time. But, you know, we had to learn the moves. And, you know... We had to we had to have that in us. And we know it's true. true. You know that's that's the thing. You know, but by the time you you live this life after a, a, a period of time, whatever, I mean, you, it becomes true to you. Yeah. Uh, simply because you do believe it. That's you know? it. I mean, that's what it takes. It takes about, that's, that's what faith is about. That's about building a relationship. That's it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not rules and regulations. It's not you know all that. Do all the right stuff. It's yeah. about or. Help me. Show Sorry. me which way to go. And you know, living. don't don't leave me. Help me. And, and guess what? It does require us to be part of it too. You know, that's the thing. It's like, okay, get up and let's go. It's a walk. You know, doesn't matter whether you feel dead to sin. You are to consider it so. Why? Because it is so. Um, people wrongly wonder what experience must I have in order to, to for this to be true. When we choose to believe what is true about ourselves and sin and walk in, the, walk in the basis of what we believe, our right relationship with sin will work out in our experience. And that's it. It's, it'll, it'll just manifest in your life. Um, but as long as we, are, we put our experience before our belief, oh, life stinks. Oh, you know, come on. Come on, I don't feel accepted. I don't feel loved. You know, oh, what, what, oh, what, what, what used to make me feel better? Let's do that. No, no, no. Let's let's believe. Let's get that peace that the Lord has for us. Uh, we will never fully know the freedom. You know, if we, if we let that, you know, our experience become before our belief, we'll never fully know the freedom that Christ purchased for us on the cross. You know, Romans six one through eleven instructs us to believe. Now, Romans 6, 12, and 13 tells us how to relate to sin. Um, Those verses say, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting, keep on, you know, presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of righteousness. But present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of God to righteousness. Again, that's saying a lot given myself over to sin anymore, I'm going to give myself over to God. Uh, sin is a master which demands service from its slaves, okay? Um, you're dead to sin, but you still have the capacity to serve it, okay, um, by putting your body at its disposal. Um, it's up to you to choose whether you're going to let your body be used for sin or for righteousness. Um, Satan, who is at the root of all sin, because guess what? That first sin started with him. Um, will take advantage of anyone who tries to remain neutral. Um, your body is also also yours to use to serve either God or sin and Satan. But the choice is up to you. Um, let's see. But that's why Paul so insistently said in, in, in Romans 12, 1, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices and uh, living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. What's that? That's I'm giving myself to you. Everything I do is for you. That's it. Here I am. Take it. I don't want to do the things I used to do. Everything I do in my body, I'm going to give to you, Lord. You know, because of Christ's victory over sin, we are completely free to choose not to obey sin as our, as our master. If we come to Christ, once time we say, say no to sin, guess what? That proves we can say no all the time. But we have to choose it. Um, it's our responsibility not to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. And if you can see where this is going, we're setting this thing up. It's like sin is like this separate thing. It's not us. So let's see what it goes, where it goes. You can be free from the power of sin. Yes, we know how hard the battle is. We know it can be a constant, persistent struggle. I faced it myself. I'm sure all of you have faced it. Um, so, did the, so did the Apostle Paul, you know? He was an apostle and he faced it. He wrote all about it in Romans seven fifteen through 25 out of the same feelings of frustration that we all experience. Uh, Romans seven fifteen and 16 says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. 
For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I don't, do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. You know? uh, these verses describe the experience of what it is like to struggle with sin. We desire to do what God says is right, but sometimes we find ourselves doing just the opposite. Um, it is very defeating when we know what we want to do, but for some reason, reason can't do it. Uh, persistent sin may make us wonder if we really are a Christian, if the Christian life is even possible, or if God is really there for us at all. Um, if, if God and us were the only players in the scenario, it would you know, stand a reason that we would either blame God or blame ourselves for our problems. Yeah. Um, but verse 17 in seven, uh, Romans 17, uh, 7 says that there is an, uh, another player in this, in this picture. And that says, um, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Now, many think that this, this, th- that this is telling us that we're no good. Um, but that's not what it says. In fact, it says the opposite. It says that sin which dwells in me, that is the nothing good that dwells in me. That's the sin that is dwelling in you is not you. If you had a wood splinter in your finger, it would be nothing good in you. But that nothing good isn't you, it's the splinter. And so, likewise, the sin that is in you isn't you, but it's in you. It, also, it is also important to note that, that this nothing good is not even your flesh. Because a lot of people go, oh, this flesh, it's the body, it's, you know, this is it. But no, it's not even your flesh, but it is dwelling in your flesh. If we see ourselves in the struggle, it would be hopeless to live righteously. You know, if we only see it as us, because it's my body, you can't get, you know, if you think it's your flesh, well, what am I going to do? I'm in my flesh all the time. But if we see sin as this power or this temptation or whatever it is, as separate from us, as these verses indicate, then it changes everything. Um, You know. These passages are going to great lengths to tell us that there is a second party involved in our sin struggle whose nature is different from ours. You see, when you see, you see, when you and I were born, we were born under the penalty of sin. Okay, um, and and we know that Satan and his emissaries are always working to keep us under the penalty of sin. When God saved us, Satan lost that battle. Game's over. But he doesn't give up. He is now committed to keep us under the power of sin. He also, we also know that he is going to work through the flesh, which remained after salvation. As we read on, we can learn more about how this battle is being waged. In Romans seven nineteen through 21, it says, For the good that I want to do, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I, I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want... I am no longer the one doing it. I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. The evil's in me, but I'm the one who wants to do good. That's a spiritual. How about that? I mean that. That's it. That's, this is a spiritual battle. Yeah. Um, there it is. There, I mean, it's in there, but man... You might not see this. You could read this verse a million times and not see this. A lot of people don't. And you might, you might be listening at home and go, what is he talking about? Mm-hmm. But, but it's in there. And so read the book. Anderson goes over it. For these passages, uh, from these passages, we clearly identify that sin and evil is the nature of that nothing good which indwells me. Um, there is no question that you and I sin. So, you know, these paradoxes are a little tough because, yes, we do. But we are not sin in, as such. You know, evil is present in us, but we are not evil per se. Uh, this does not excuse us from sinning. Right. So no, we can't go <laughs> as much as you know, the other extreme is like, oh, it's, the devil made me do it. Sin lives in me. No, no, you're still in the process. But it's pushing you towards it. 
So, you know, there's, this is the battle that we wage. Um, you know, so we're still responsible, sorry. Um, Romans 6.12 uh, says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lust. That separate thing, telling you to obey its lust. For the word of God never commands us to do something we can't do. And so there you go. Um, we may sin, but the Holy Spirit reveals that we really are Christians. Why? Because we feel convicted by our sin. And we rejoice over the things of God. Because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't, if we weren't a Christian, we wouldn't care about our sin. And we certainly wouldn't care about the things of God. Um, uh, go, go, go outside and talk to some people on the street. Uh, they'll tell you all about the, how they are not impressed by the things of God. Um, and that's, and they'll and just go to a sinful environment and uh, you, you'll hear all kinds of things, but you won't think, hear about anyone loving the things of God. Um, Romans 7.22 says, For I joyfully concur with the Lord in the inner man. Why would you agree with the law of the Lord or think things of God are good unless you are a Christian? Um, when we act out of character with who we really are, a Christian, the Holy Spirit immediately brings conviction because of our union with God. And we often take it out on ourselves. Right. You know, we're not doing it right. So we beat ourselves up. But soon our true nature expresses itself again. Uh, and we are drawn back to God, you know. Yeah, we messed up, but man, I feel sorry, and I'm going to try to, you know, turn over a new leaf and walk the right way, you know. But, you know, that doesn't happen for sinners. I know, I used to be one. It just didn't, you know, I wasn't going back to church every week, <laughs> you know. I knew where it was. I didn't forget the address. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wasn't going back because I was walking in darkness, and, you know. So, yeah, so when we turn back to God... That inner person, that true self, you know, that's the true self being, being expressed. We are a child of God in a battle with sin. Uh, verse 23 of, of uh, Romans 7 describes the nature of this battle with sin. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. According to this passage, the, the battle is being fought in the mind. If Satan can get you to think that you are only the only one in the battle, you'll get down on, on yourself or God when you sin. God, why would you make me this way? Or why do I always do this? I'm evil, right? Well, um, let's put it this way. <laughs> uh, if a dog named Rin Tin Sin uh, came along and bit you on the leg, would you beat on yourself or beat on the dog? Now, beating on yourself would only cause you further injury, you know. Um, so if you want the dog to stop hurting you, you'll beat on the dog. You know? But unfortunately, in our struggle with sin, nobody has ever told us that it's the dog. It's sin. Written sin, uh, which is inflicting the pain. Uh, so people beat on themselves, and when they tire of it, they walk away from God uh, filled with defeat and condemnation and decide to just go live with the dog. That's the way it is. That's, the, that's my besetting sin, my pet sin. Um, we are familiar with the dog and figure he's ours to keep and his bite isn't too bad. We usually manage it, you know, uh, to some extent. You know, That's where the despair in verse 24 of, of Romans 7 comes from. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Um, he's not saying wicked man that I am. He's saying miserable that, man that I am. Um, he is defeated because he is not free. His attempts to do the right thing are met with defeat. He wonders, is there any victory? Is there? Well, <laughs> verse 25 gives the answer. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, the, with, on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Jesus is the answer. Paul was frustrated over his failure, but he doesn't get down on himself. He accepts his responsibility, but doesn't blame himself and expresses confidence by turning to God because Jesus was, will enable him to live above sin. That's why I tell those sinners to save by grace. You know, those people who quote those verses, Romans 7, well, Richard, I always do the things I don't want to do. They're right. 
But the thing they forgot to do was keep reading. Um, because it, <laughs> keep reading. It's a progressive revelation. Let's just move along. Um, Romans 8 1 says, Therefore, therefore there is n- now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free um, from the law of sin and death. Now, I think it was Pastor Romano, or Dr. Romano, I should say, who taught, you know, on this verse uh, that when we, when we look at this verse, we should look at law as authority. And the authority of the spirit of life has set you free. And that has authority over sin and death. How do we know that? Well, Jesus conquered sin and death. He had led us in this life, conquered sin, and he raised from the dead. So that's what this, that verse is talking about. A little hard to see, you know. Um, that's why you go to Bible college. Uh, but, but we don't have to go to Bible college where we, you know, when, when we know these things, we can share them. Um, but yeah, that, that spirit of life, that, that gives us freedom over law of sin and death. And we don't have to you know, obey law, the law of sin and death. And we're not going to obey death, but we won't know that until we physically die. Um, but we can know our victory over sin here and now. Um, Condemning yourself won't help because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You need to understand the nature of the battle for your mind. Then you need to discover where you are losing that battle. That's what we need to do. We got to go to instant replay. What did we do? What happened? How did we, how did we fall into sin? God, how can I change this? Um, you know, we, we have to see how we're allowing that sin to reign in our body. When you discover it and deal with it, you can find freedom in Christ. Now, what that is, is that's breaking strongholds. Because strongholds are established patterns that we need to you know, break up. Um, the, center, the center of our spiritual bondage is the mind. That's where the battle must be fought and won if we are to experience the freedom in Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3, and 5, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. But that's strongholds in other versions. Um, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Mm. Now, what's that? But every everything raised up against destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. What's that? That's the way of the world. Uh, this is how we, yeah. This is how we live. You know, this is how you know. This is what works. There's God's way, but let's get real. You know, that's that's the things we need to take. We need to take captive um, because oh yeah yeah you know God says, but come on, you know, be real, be real. Well, we can be real. We can be real Christians. Um, and what do we do? We have to take those thoughts captive because otherwise we'll just live the way we did all the time before, independently of God. You know, the big, the, the, the big thing that I thought of, um, the way we live independently of God is through lying. That's the first thing we learn as a, as a person on this earth, that lying works <laughs> like big time. Like you learn it as a kid. Did you do that? Not me, mom. It was whatever, <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing you do. And what, what happens? Like your lie doesn't get found out that one time. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> that works. Now and now we'll, get, we'll be doing that for the rest of our life. And we're, and we're living independently of God. You know, we'll do it our way instead of his way. Um, some fortresses of bad habits and sinful thought patterns were established when you learn to live your life independently of God, like lying. Um, your non-Christian environment taught you, and you'll see, you know, and sometimes, you know, the, I think it was uh, that one Christmas movie. It was, uh, uh, it was a wonderful life. No, not, not that one. Of course not. It's a Christmas story where the kid wanted a Red Ryder BB gun. Oh. Well, like, Are well, like, yeah, and, and so he wanted this red, you know, this this Red Rider BB gun, and uh, part of the, the, you know, he got in a fight or something, and he sw- he when he was when he was angry and beating on this kid, he was swearing like a sailor, sailor, and and they 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 did the old punishment for swearing. They put soap in his mouth, yeah. and <laughs> and and so and so they're like, where did you hear that word? And 
you know, and, and the narrative, the kid says, like, I've heard my dad say that a thousand times, but yeah. I couldn't say that. So he said some kid. And, then this, and so the mother runs to the phone and she calls the, the other mother and he says, do you know what he said? And then she whispers the word. I'm like, oh, no, not that. <laughs> and like, and like where do, you, do you know where he heard that from? And she's like, probably from his father. <laughs> and it's the response over the phone. He's like, no, he's heard it from your son. And of course, you hear the other kid screaming in agony as he's getting beat by his mom but but you know that's it you know um <laughs> i don't know where i was going with that but anyway you know it was taught like some of the sins unfortunately we learn right from the people who are closest to us, our parents um you know our first example and that's you know that's that's in psychology they'll tell you too you know the, the things we learn the first five years of our life are patterns that will will keep will you know for that'll stick with us for a long time um just sort of that's the way we do things around here you know and so 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 be careful what you do in front of your kids because those patterns will uh will live um those patterns and responses are ingrained in your mind as strongholds uh, but when you become a christian nobody pressed the clear button like i said all those strongholds uh are still in there your old fleshly habits and patterns weren't erased they are still part of your flesh which must be dealt with daily. Um, thankfully, however, you are not just the products of your past. Um, you are a new creature in Christ. Old strongholds can be destroyed. Um, ask me how I know. And, and the thing about strongholds, we have to know they exist because sometimes we don't know it. We don't really think of it as a stronghold. We don't think of, you know, we, like I said, it's just business as usual. Um, we can't destroy, like, like, you know, stronghold. I think of like a, a machine gun nest, you know, that usually they're camouflaged. Um, you know, so we, we, the soldiers walk through and they get blown away. Um, we don't, we can't destroy strongholds we don't know about. So we have to, we have to get in the word of God, find out what righteousness is, find out what truth is and look at our experience, um, you know, and see what we're doing. Um, you know, just because you're now a new Christian, don't think Satan is no longer interested in manipulating oh. you, uh, to his purposes, through your mind, you know, Satan's perpetual aim is to infiltrate your thoughts with his thoughts and to promise his lie, you know, to promote his lie in the face of God's truth. He knows that if he can control your thoughts, he can control your behavior. And we talked about last week, um, you know, basically the, uh, you know, the scene in the Bible where, where Peter pronounces Jesus as the Christ. And then shortly after that, he, uh, <laughs> Jesus decides to share what's going to happen. He's like, I'm going to go to the city, be delivered up to the leaders and die. Peter's like, no, 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 wait, that'll never happen to you. And Jesus re retorts, get, you know, get behind me, Satan. Because that selfish spirit of self-preservation, you know, my, my good over your, everyone else's good is the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of the devil. It's the selfishness. So if you want to know what the stronghold in your life is, selfishness is it um and you know like i said the things we put our time into is are the things we worship more than the lord and some of those things are not so good uh let's see you know but satan is clever his attacks are subtle and deceptive scripture clearly teaches that satan put thoughts in our in the minds even as he did with david when he told him to number the people of israel when it was forbidden um, he did it to Judas, obviously, who betrayed Christ. He said, uh, Christ said to him, you know, the spirit of Satan is in you. Um, and Peter betrayed Christ three times. And, and, and Peter, Peter, exactly, we're, we're, not, we're not perfect. And what did he say to Peter? He said, Satan would have shifted you like wheat, but I prayed for you. And so why wasn't Peter lost? Well, you know, it wasn't according to God's purposes. Um, you know, it's why, why one apostle over the other, God's purposes, um, because they were influenced, but so you'd say, well, Judas was influenced by Satan, but guess what? We're responsible for our own sin, right? So you're going to pay, you're going to pay the price. If you right. say, if you say yes to sin, the one who pays the consequences is you, yeah. you know, because Satan's already going to pay for his consequences. You know, he's got a whole different rap um, of punishment that he's going to have to face, but we each have our own uh, to face if we don't reconcile with God. Right. Yeah. You know, which is, you know, uh, they say basically, you know, I think it's Revelation, uh, 
there's, there's the judgment for the believer is to give out rewards. The judgment for everybody else is to dole out the punishment. Um, you know, because we're declared righteous the moment we say yes to Christ. Why would anybody not want to? Right? Because I want to do it my way. You can't tell me. That's a lie. Because I believe the lies. And that's it. And because honestly, you know, it's spiritually, it's a spiritual thing. Um, God gives it's us, selfish, God, God allows us to see it. Because yeah. they say in the Bible that Satan's blinded everyone else. And, and guess what? Oh, Satan blinded everyone else. Again, mm. you choose. Part of you chooses. You're blinded, but your sin's going to, you know, God's amazing grace is amazing because, because we all deserve judgment, okay? We're not special because we know God, you know, we've chosen God, um, because every one of us should, should be condemned, but it's amazing grace that some of us would be saved, you know, so I can't say, oh, it's not fair, because all of us should go. Um, it is fair. It is. It's, it's right. It's righteous and just. And in and in Acts, the book of uh, uh, Ananias was was told uh, to hold back some of the money. You sold the land. Tell them you gave, you're given all the money, and then hold back some for yourself. Yeah. And why was that such a big crime? Because it was lying to, to, you know, to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Exactly. But lying to the Holy Spirit. Um, he can introduce his thoughts, tempting you to act independently, of God, as if they were your own thoughts or even God's thoughts. So when we're doing something and we get a thought that's sort of contrary and say, hey, you know what? I think we'll do this. You know, luckily I catch myself because I'm trying to take every thought captive. And now I live as a single man again because of my divorce. So like I'll get worldly thoughts of like, Hey, go on that dating app and where people just hook up and all the time. And like, Hey, that's not a, wait a minute. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not what I want to do as a Christian. Um, no, 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 no. You know, um, no. Um, so yeah, you'll get all kinds of great ideas, but sometimes those ideas aren't yours. Um, it, it that's why we really have to be, you know, stand on our foundation of who we are in Christ. You know, Anderson shares a story of one of his seminary students. Um, his name was Jay, who was reporting problems with his uh, concentrating and strange physical sensations. He was, you know, he was having trouble with his studies because he couldn't think and weird things were happening to him. Uh, his inter- you know, he interviewed him and it revealed that Jay was asking for and obeying spiritual guidance moment to moment. Like everything he was doing, he was asking for God to tell him to do stuff. Jay was asking God for everything he did, and from, from what he had for lunch to where to go to church. And the voices uh, ended up directing Jay to go to a Mormon church. Uh, Mormon churches believe basically you become God. Um, so not a, not a Christian denomination. Um, Jay sincerely wanted to do what God wanted him to do, but he was listening to subjective thoughts as if they were for the, the voice were God's voice instead of taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In doing so, he opened himself up to Satan's activity uh, in his life, resulting in his theological theological studies being sabotaged. And that's it, you know. Yeah, we see <laughs> to discern the spirits. They tell you to discern the spirits as a Christian. Yeah. Um, the Spirit of God is never going to tell you to do anything contrary to the Word of God. That's right. That's the number one way we can discern. Yeah. So when it said, hey, go to the, uh, to the Mormon church, should have said, wait a second. Well, let's, let's see what the Mormon church is about. Oh, they believe in the Bible and this three other books. Uh, <laughs> wait, uh, that's, uh, didn't Christ say the can, you know, there's... Yeah. Canon was closed. It's basically the word of God, and that's what you trust. And uh, 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 that, and a million other doctrines. If you want to have some fun, go to you know go go to YouTube and ask about Mormon heaven. They'll show you this promotional video that the, the Church of Latter Day Saints created that told people they would have their own planet someday because they'd be God. <laughs> and it's a cartoon, and it's real um, because that's. That's what they believe because they believe in another. They believe in another revelation beyond the Bible. Um, so that's a problem. Um, so when the spirits, these voices, were telling him to go there, you shouldn't go there. And the spirits that tell me to go to Tinder, uh, those aren't God either. Um, you know, that's that's not God. Um, 
You know, the end result of your leading will tell you, you know, where, what the spirit is. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, uh, we're a spirit-filled church. We believe in the gifts of the spirit. And sometimes we get a word of knowledge and we get stuff. And as somebody who came from outside of, of, of a church that believes in that, I was very hesitant to, to listen and really questioned a lot of the things that I encountered as I walked in Christ. But I was always given comfort from the fact that I was continually led into righteousness. I wasn't, you know, becoming a prophet, <laughs> although, you know, that's another story. Um, but, but, you know, I wasn't led to do anything that was wrong. And, and I would listen to the most conservative guys who taught against, you know, crazy charismatic or whatever, and go, you know what, that's not me. The, the things you're describing are not my experience. I am led to, to go to the Word. I'm led to serve. I'm led to live a righteous life. And if that's the spirit that's leading me, that's the spirit of God. And so we have to, you know, even in our church, in churches, you know, when we get a word of knowledge or whatever, we got to see what it's telling us. And we test those spirits and we, we make sure that it lines up with the word of God. You know, if you don't conquer Satan's temptation right at the threshold of your mind, you will begin to mull his thought over, consider it as an option, and eventually choose to act it out. You know, repeated acts form a habit. And if you exercise a simple habit long enough, a stronghold will be established in your mind. Once a stronghold is established, you have lost the ability to control your behavior. You just do it all the time. Um, the best example I have for that is when you're a thief. Um, I used to be somewhat of a thief. Um, steal stuff all the time. Hey, you know, like I said, I thought I was evil. There's a reason why. <laughs> you know, I, I was stealing stuff, whatever, was, you know, whatever I could get away with. Um, when you start stealing, the first time you steal, there's, there's, there's fear of being caught, um, fear that it's wrong. Um, but when you get away with it, hey, it makes it that much easier to steal next time. And, and, yeah. and it actually changes the way you think um, because, because it, it went from not being mine and being theirs to being mine eventually. Like, you know, that, that will be, if it's something I want, I'll get it. I'll get it. You know, I'll get it. I'll take a rock and crash a window or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's the real, you know, that's, that takes control. It's changing your mindset, your worldview. Everything is mine for the taking. Um, you know, how are strongholds destroyed? We, patterns of negative thinking and behavior are learned, and they can be unlearned yes. through disciplined Bible study yeah. and counseling. Now, the counseling is like, oh, do I have to get on a couch somewhere? No. The counselor is like you, your friends, anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get over this thing, be accountable to somebody, you know, counsel. Um, what's, that, what's that verse on uh, counselors? Uh, two or three in a company of counselors there's wisdom uh, no it says with, in a, with a multitude of counselors there is safety there is safety that's there you go up. that's it but yeah no, so counsel no. and whose counsel do we take God. the word of God exactly so some strongholds are anchored in demonic influences and spiritual conflicts from past and present mental assaults which lock victims in their bondage these people need to be freed from the shackles of Satan. Well, it's lies by God's truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Uh, I hope you're sensing that the fact that victory is truly available to those who are in Christ. Uh, there is a war raging, but we are on the winning side. For, for we are more than conquerors in Christ. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, that's our life. Um, you know, we have to follow the Lord and, uh, and stand on who we are in Christ, and we can overcome. Um, that's the lesson for tonight. Let me close out in prayer, but we'll talk after, after I stop the podcast. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for uh, bringing us together. Um, thank you for reminding us who we are in Christ. Thank you for showing us uh, that sin is in us, but is not, not us. It is separate, and it can be stopped, and it can be uh, put aside as we walk in righteousness by the power of your Holy Spirit in us uh, to live out who we are in Christ every day. Um, by, by, not by our might, but by loving you and being drawn into the righteous life and peace uh, that you have for us. Uh, all these things I pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Amen.